And I'm just going to start with a great big welcome and, and thank you everybody for taking time out of your evening uh, to talk about our amazing Lake Huron Fisheries. Uh, this is the first of three uh, Lake Huron Fisheries workshops. These are workshops we hold annually each year with the goal of bringing together fisheries researchers and managers with anglers and communities and really anybody that's involved or interested with our, our Great Lakes uh, fisheries on the Lake Huron side. And uh, as you see, uh, we have a great program. Uh, this is the first of several uh, workshops that will be hosted over the next handful, uh, the next few Thursdays. Uh, so if you're excited about this conversation, there's more to look forward to. Um, we'll have a great conversation tonight. Um, next week, we will be partnering with the DNR for their conversation and coffee session. Uh, following that, we'll have a Sea Grant Saginaw Bay session on May 14th. And on May 21st, a Cedarville uh, Lational Island area uh, focused session. So these sessions, these workshops, including today's session, will all be recorded and posted online. So if you, you want to share them with friends or family, or if you want to look back for something you might have missed, uh, you'll have that opportunity. But being here live, you have, have the, the most, uh, the best part of the program uh, is the opportunity to engage and ask questions directly of the, the presenters themselves. So again, we uh, typically host these workshops in person and out in our coastal communities, but given you know, the current health concerns, well, uh, we, can't, we can't do that. So I really want to appreciate all of the partners. You're going to hear from a lot of them tonight who really rallied around uh, this idea of, of keeping the conversation moving ahead um, and, and using the Zoom online uh, virtual webinar format as a way to continue our annual spring uh, workshop conversations because we believe they're, they're, worth, they're worth having if even on online. So thank you for joining. Uh, expecting a great conversation. Glad you can be a part of this. If, if you're not uh, here as participants, uh, we, we don't have this conversation. So everybody showing up to talk fish is, is what makes, makes this happen. Uh, so here I've listed the agenda and uh, we'll try to stay in order. I'll try to moderate and make sure we stay relatively on time. We hope to uh, adjourn uh, by eight o'clock, but we're happy also to stay on uh, longer to continue answering questions that we aren't able to get to through the program. Um, actually, I'm gonna go back here. So before I, I get started, I always uh, like to start these uh, on the front end, front end with a thank you. There's, uh, these, are, these are Sea Grant workshops, but these are really truly uh, partnered workshops. There's a lot of um, organizations and, and people that have put time and energy into planning and thinking about uh, what we wanted to share tonight. And so I wanted to thank, every, thank some of these partners, all of these partners on the front end. Uh, foremost, our, our research and management agencies and universities. There's a wealth of expertise in our, our digital room right now, uh, sharing science and management content updates tonight. Uh, you know, we have DNR uh, fisheries researchers and managers, the USGS Great Lakes Science Center, uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service, the Eagle Office of, of, of the Great Lakes, um, Saginaw Bay Reef Restoration a Partnership contributing to the Saginaw Bay session and our own Michigan State University Department of Fisheries and Wildlife and others. There's others that have contributed to some of the work you're going to hear about tonight. Uh, really appreciating this collective knowledge and effort contributed tonight. On the community partner side, we have a, a bunch of great uh, uh, fisheries organizations and partners. Again, we typically host these out in communities, uh, but all of, of these partners really stepped up and helped to make sure that we were able to get the word out and, and make this opportunity available to you. So partners like the Michigan Charter Boat Association, the Michigan Steelhead and Salmon Fishermen's Association, Blue Water Sport Fishing Association, Hammond Bay Area Anglers Association, Lake Huron Sport Fishing Incorporated, Saginaw Bay Walleye Club, Thunder Bay Walleye Club, Thunder Bay Steelheaders, Detroit area steelheaders, and many, many more. Uh, the point is, is there's a lot of folks that have, have really um, helped us to think this through. And, and the last uh, note is, is the Lake Huron Citizen Fishery Advisory Committee, which is an advisory committee to the, to the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, Frank Christ, who many of you uh, may know, is the chair of this committee. He's joining us uh, and listening in online tonight. Uh, it's worth noting that this committee you know, gathers uh, quarterly and contributes input and ideas as, as advisors to the Department of Natural Resources on the side of Lake Huron Fisheries. But I also see this advisory group as my, our Michigan Sea Grant advisory group in thinking and planning and promoting uh, what we share in these workshops. So I wanna thank Frank uh, for being a part of that. Frank and I will be capturing uh, the conversation and, and documenting, uh, you know, questions that come up tonight. And we'll be certainly sharing those back with that citizen advisory group. They appreciate uh, that input and know 
that that's an advisory group that you can always uh, share uh, feedback with. Uh, so finally, our own Michigan Sea Grant team. Uh, my name is Brandon Schroeder. I'm an extension educator serving uh, out of Alpena County with the uh, Michigan Sea Grant and Michigan State University Extension. I want to introduce uh, my colleagues, my Sea Grant Extension colleagues on the Lake Huron side, Megan Goss in the Saginaw Bay region, who will be co-facilitating tonight. Hi, Megan. And uh, I don't believe with us tonight, but uh, later for the Lake Chino Island, Island area session, uh, Elliot Nelson. Uh, in the Eastern Upper Peninsula will be joining us as well. We have a fantastic, amazing communication team, uh, Cindy Hudson, Geneva Langland, uh, helping out in the background, and along with a lot of other team members uh, that have been part of, of, of putting this uh, session together. Uh, just a quick note about Sea Grant, who we are. We're not a regulatory, we're a university-based program. We're a NOAA program, the NOAA, the National um, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, uh, program, uh, but as a university-based program, we're a partnership here in Michigan through uh, Michigan State University uh, Extension and the University of Michigan. Our role is really uh, supporting and promoting Great Lakes science and research, and through education and outreach, um, helping to, to make that research available and useful in our coastal communities, thinking about that sustainable uh, use and, and the benefits that we get uh, and the values we have in our Great Lakes uh, resources. Uh, some of the areas we work beyond fisheries, uh, a lot of coastal community development, coastal community economy work. Uh, we do a lot of uh, healthy coastal ecosystem and, and habitat uh, types of, of work. And you'll hear about a Saginaw Bay uh, Reef Restoration Project we partnered in uh, in a couple weeks down the road. Again, fisheries and aquaculture and, and a lot of time spent in terms of environmental literacy, workforce development, at the education side of our work with uh, schools and education uh, initiatives. Uh, I would like to just, you know, really just say I, I hope you'll see Michigan Sea Grant as providing a lot of great uh, resources. Um, they're available uh, uh, to you through our website and our bookstore. Just wanted to call attention to a couple uh, that you might have interest in tonight. Uh, one, we just are, are now proud to have released our revised and updated Life of the Lakes uh, publication, a publication that looks at our Great Lakes fisheries from an ecological management perspective, what our fishery looks like today, uh, a dive back into history and, and some of the history that came uh, in, into play in terms of shaping our fishery as we know it today, and a look into the future, thinking about some of the issues and, and management concerns that we, uh, you know, consider when looking at our, our Great Lakes fisheries. And then uh, also new uh, and hot off the press is, is the Salmon and Trout um, Great Lakes ID Guide, uh, a pretty neat publication I would have handed out to you in person, but uh, you can download it uh, from our website. And again, just the map of, of some of our coastal offices and our offices in East Lansing and Ann Arbor. Um, if, you, if, you, if you don't find it on our website, please give us a call and, and we'll see if we can help you out, out in person. Um, lastly, just saying, you know, uh, part of our role, uh, having receiving federal funds, our role uh, and values are really making sure that all of our educational programs and resources are, are open uh, to anyone and all without uh, discrimination. And so any any opportunities to share our, our work and resources, uh, please, please feel free to do that. And I'm going to introduce, uh, I always uh, think of food webs. Uh, we talk about food webs and food chains a lot in our work with schools and one of the things we always try to impress on on students is you don't have big fish if you don't have little fish so I'm going to start by introducing uh, Dale Hundorp is with the USGS Great Lakes Science Center so the USGS Great Lakes Science Center is responsible for the a lot, a lot of the, the the prey fish surveys that happen on each of the Great Lakes and so Daryl is going to share uh, that work and update for Lake Huron. So with that, I will mute myself and pass uh, the reins to you, Daryl. All right, thank you, Brandon. Really appreciate that introduction. Uh, hello to everybody out there. Um, really appreciate you dialing in or logging in for this presentation. There we go. Um, just wanted to uh, acknowledge uh, my colleagues, Tim O'Brien and uh, Ed Roseman. Uh, for their assistance with putting this talk together uh, this evening. Um, so as Brian, as uh, Brandon said, we're going to be talking about uh, crayfish. Um, I think most of you know what we're talking about here, but just to, just so that everybody's on the same page here, 
I've got a little stylized uh, Lake Huron food web here, and the species we're, we're talking about are essentially these small-bodied uh, fish species that, uh, in general, don't feed on fish themselves, but feed on small crustacean bugs, planktonic organisms, and the like. Um, there's a lot of reasons why these, this particular guild or community of fish is important. Um, but one of the main ones is, as, as Brandon said, these are the species that, that uh, supply food to the salmon and trout and walleye and many of the species that support important uh, recreational and, and commercial fisheries. Um, because of that, um, and because these fish tend to not stay within jurisdictional boundaries, the Great Lakes states, uh, the tribes in the province of Canada have uh, asked the USGS, uh, my agency, to take the lead role in um, surveying prey fish populations in all of the Great Lakes. Tonight we'll be uh, specifically focusing on Lake Huron. And basically all of these assessments have as their major purpose to describe the trends in the abundance and species composition of the prey fish community in each one of the lakes. Um, the focus area for these assessments are, and I want to make this point, the, the deep offshore areas. We don't, none of our assessments cover water shallower than 30 feet right now. Uh, many of the states run their own uh, sampling programs or assessments in water shallower than that. Uh, the USGS is primarily focused on, on deep offshore uh, water, so we start working at about 30 feet and we work all the way out to 350, 400 feet sometimes. Um, the two tools we use to assess uh, prey fish populations in the lake are, uh, bot or at least in Lake Huron, are the bottom trawl, which is just a big net we drag along the bottom, and then a uh, integrated acoustics midwater trawl survey, which uses the same sort of technology that's in your fish finders to count echoes of fish uh, in the water. And this is a survey that we do jointly with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, these two uh, surveys, uh, there's some differences between them. Uh, obviously, the bottom trawl is sampling uh, fish that are associated with the bottom of the lake. Most of the prey fish species in the lake are, are associated with the bottom for at least a portion of the day. Not all, but most. Um, this is our longest running Lake, Hur lake Huron survey. It started in 1976 and has is, is, uh, been conducted just about every year uh, from then till, till last year. Um, but it's somewhat spatially limited. Uh, you can see on this figure to the right here, uh, these little blue circles show where we do the trawl survey. And it really, we're only covering mostly the Michigan shoreline. And then in the 1990s, we added these uh, sites over here in Canadian waters near Goderich, Ontario. Um, in contrast, uh, the acoustics midwater trawl surveys, uh, they're focused on fish that are suspended in the water column up above the bottom. These two surveys uh, sample some of the same species, but uh, the acoustics and midwater trawl is catching them when they're off the bottom. Um, in contrast to the bottom trawl survey, this is a true whole lake survey. It covers all areas of the main basin and also gets into Georgian Bay and the North Channel. Um, but this survey was, was initiated a little bit uh, more recently. At first, uh, they had kind of a pilot year in 1970, 1997, and then it's been a kind of a regular occurrence since uh, 2004. So as I talk to you, I'm going to try to blend, uh, kind of integrate the data from these two different surveys. They give us kind of complementary information. I'll probably use the bottom trawl data set a little bit more when I'm talking, trying to give you a historical perspective. Uh, but then when I want to talk about the distributions of these fish, I'll probably lean more on the acoustics since it does a better job of, of covering the area. So let's get started here. Um, this first um, figure is, uh, is a, something it's called a stacked area chart. And basically what it's showing you is, is the uh, the amount of fish or the biomass of prey fish 
in the lake and then the different color scheme, the different colors kind of show you what portion of that total is comprised of different species groups. And there's a little legend up here if you want to know what the different colors mean. And I think the first thing that will jump out at you, um, and if you've heard me give this presentation before, you'll see that we've had a, a very large decline in the offshore the biomass of offshore prey fish um, since about the mid 1990s. Um, we, we, we reached really low points in 2009 and again in, in 2015 and 17. The past couple of years, uh, biomass has popped up again, but it's still at levels uh, well below historical averages. Um, there's, there's probably a lot of things going on in the lake, a lot of disruptions that are involved in this decline. One of the things that's happening is that due to the passage of the Clean Air and Water Acts, we have fewer, less nutrients entering the system. So the, the lake is becoming a little less productive, probably becoming a little closer to its historical status. Um, so it's supporting uh, smaller numbers of fish. But uh, many of you are aware of this event, but this is the event that's probably most likely to, most likely involved in this decline. And that was the introduction of the zebra mussel in the early 90s and then the quagga mussel um, more recently in the, the early 2000s. And these invasive mussels have since uh, invaded all parts of the lake. And uh, what ecologists think has happened is that uh, while the mechanism is still not entirely clear, um, either by uh, biomass getting soaked up into zebra mussel and quagga mussel tissue, or these, these animals are siphoning off energy, particularly the zebra mussels siphoning off energy in the nearshore zone that would have formerly been exported to offshore areas. There's just less energy, less nutrients getting to the offshore food whip, and hence we've seen um, you know, a smaller, a lower biomass of, of prey fish in, this, in these offshore habitats. Um, the other thing we're, we're, you can see from this plot is that we have really low species diversity. Um, you see in prior to 2000, there was a number of different species and species groups that were um, contributing to the offshore biomass. But as we move out past 2010, you can see it's primarily this, this blue colored. Um, and if we look at the species composition of fish we collected in the bottom trawl in 2019, 87.3% 80, of the biomass was a single species, uh, which we call bloater. We'll talk about them uh, more specifically in a minute, but that, that's pretty incredible to have um, so much of your biomass localized, uh, taken up by a single species. The next most abundant was rainbow smell and uh, alewife, despite um, declines in their abundance, are still making up uh, almost 4% of the biomass. So, so big changes historically, um, uh, especially the lake we have now compared to what it was um, in the 80s and 90s. So now I wanna jump into looking at some of the trends in abundance of some of these major species. We'll start with alewife, uh, simply because uh, you can see the disappear, they're this green color in this chart, um, and they really drop off the map here. Um, many of you are aware this is a non-native planktivore, uh, entered the Great Lakes through the, the Welland Canal system and really proliferated in all the lakes in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, it's had a lot of a negative effects on native prey fish, but it's also been the preferred prey of, of salmon and trout. So, um, um, so its abundance, so trends in its abundance have, have often been related to uh, predation. Um, however, this, uh, this decline in, um, uh, hang on a second, move my uh, video screen out of the way here. Um, this major decline, in, what we see is that these fish, uh, these are, this is yearling and older in life, so the, the larger animals. Um, that are age one or older, you can see that uh, their numbers crashed in around 2004 and really have since not recovered. Um, there's been, the causes of this have been really debated. Some folks feeling that this was 
related mostly to predation. Some folks feeling that this was due to loss of nutrients getting to the, the offshore. Um, there was also a really tough winter, a really cold winter in 2002, 2003 that, that knocked abundance down coming out into uh, 2003. Likely it's a factor of all of these things that, that hard winter probably reduced the adult biomass um, uh, to very low abundance levels. And uh, since then, the fact that these are preferred prey and we have lower nutrients and lower predictivity have really limited to the scope uh, of recovery possible for, for, for older ill life. Um, it's interesting when you look at this, this species, um, we have seen uh, some evidence of some recruitment or some year classes. These YOY stands for young of the year, which are basically the ill life that are produced or born in the year that they're surveyed. Um, we have seen uh, years where we have caught a fair number of them, and in the past, levels of that level of production was enough to fuel um, growth in the adult population. But as you can see, despite um, some, some year classes here, we don't really see uh, much, much of any of the way of adults. Um, in terms of distribution, they're really patchy. This is the distribution of, of young of year alewife in 2019. We just caught them in uh, uh, just a very few spots throughout the lake. Uh, moving on to, to bloater, sometimes folks call these chubs. Uh, they're a native species. Um, this is the last species of the deep, of a six or seven species group that used to be very abundant in deep and offshore waters. Uh, they prefer very deep, cold water. Uh, bloaters really aren't don't even begin showing up in the nets until uh, well after 180 feet. You can see um, they're more common than alewife. They're distributed uh, all over the lake. Um, uh, this is a figure showing the abundance of, of um, the yearling and adult, adult fish. Um, you can see that they have kind of the cyclic uh, abundance pattern. The trawl data here isn't tracking the acoustics data all that well, but there's indication that uh, numbers from both surveys are either up or trending up. And it, this species is interesting because it's even though it's relatively abundant, it's generally not a preferred prey of trout and salmon and walleye and those kinds of species. Um, its its dynamics seem to be driven more by uh, its own demographics. When the age pop when the uh, when the when the population consists of a lot of older individuals, it gets skewed. The sex ratio gets skewed towards females and uh, the fish have a tougher time successfully reproducing, whereas younger populations tend to have an equal male-female sex ratio, and so that enables them to grow. So this, this shifting sex ratio kind of allows them to kind of track, uh, maintain, control their own level of abundance so that it meshes with the available prey resources. Um, the other thing that's maybe driving the dynamics of this fish is that the young of the year the, when alewife were abundant, they seem to have a negative effect on the young bloater, either through competition with the uh, bloater or by preying on bloater larvae. Um, but you can see since the alewife crafts, we've seen really large year classes of bloater, and uh, there's a nice uh, congruence between the bottom trawl and the acoustics data here showing that numbers are they're kind of kind of popping up and down, but in general over the past 15 years, they're on their way up. So uh, these native, this native fish in particular seems to be doing okay under the uh, current lake conditions. Uh, moving over to rainbow smelt, which is another native, which has been in the lake for a very long time, probably since around the uh, early 1900s. It's very widespread, especially the young of the year. This is the distribution of the young of the year fish sampled in the acoustic survey in 29. You can see they're very abundant, very widespread. Um, like alewife, they've really declined in recent years, but their uh, decline has been much more gradual. Um, this is probably more indicative of, of a nutrient uh, effect or a limitation of 
of, of energy reaching offshore uh, prey, offshore environments than predation, but, but these fish are still fed upon by trout and salmon, so predation still could be uh, a factor in, in their abundance. And you can see that there's good agreement between uh, the acoustics and the bottom trawl and the number of yearling and older uh, rainbow smelled out in the offshore areas. Uh, like we saw for ale life, um, we are seeing recruitment, some recruitment of, or some year classes put out by these, these fish, but once again, these fish don't seem to get through the winter or at least the next year in the fall when we survey them, um, both, uh, both, this, both the bottom trawl and, and acoustics show fairly good agreement in, uh, in the numbers of young of year rainbow smelt out there. Uh, the last species I want to touch on is the round goby. Um, this is another non-native species. It's entirely benthic, lives on the bottom. Um, it's not something that's sampled in the acoustics, so this is just only bottom trawl data. Uh, as alewife have declined, it's become an important prey for a variety of, of predators out there. So photo Frank Chris sent me showing uh, one lake trout stomach uh, that he had that had probably 30, 40 gobies in it. You can see that fish can really polish on these things, can really polish off gobies when they find them. Um, but it also spends a lot of its time in near shore areas, which at depths shallower than we typically survey. So the bottom trawl time abundance series for this species has a lot of, um, a lot of uh, fluctuations in it. This could be <clears throat> just the process of this fish boom and bust cycling as it adjusts to a new environment, or it could be indicative that some years these fish are further offshore than others, um, and uh, we sample them. We tend to sample them better than in years where they uh, where they aren't quite as farther offshore. So the lab, uh, my agency is currently working on a lot of new technologies to see if we can do a better job uh, facilitating sampling of these fish. So just to wrap up, so we leave a little time for questions. Um, it seems like late conditions appear favorable for at least some native species restoration. You saw that the bloaters are doing quite well in a little later tonight, you're gonna to hear a presentation by Chris Olds, who's gonna explain uh, some work that they're doing with the introduction of Cisco. Um, the low abundance of, of alewife and uh, rainbow spelt probably makes that uh, makes this a really good time for that. Um, um, our top predators are salmon, trout, walleye, those kinds of species are probably more dependent on littoral energy pathways. It's just a fancy science way of saying that more of the energy uh, these fish are consuming is probably coming from fish who are feeding in the near shore area. Uh, you can think of goby as an example of this. Um, because so few, there are fewer offshore, because biomass of crayfish in the offshore is less. And then uh, lastly, um, this current low abundance, low biomass community with little low species diversity, diversity has been quite stable over the past um, several years. So um, it, it looks like that's where we're going to be for a while. Um, however, the fact that so much of that biomass is is wrapped up in one species that also says that the system could not be very resilient and uh, be vulnerable to change. Um, so with that, uh, thank you. I, I don't, I kind of used up most of my time here. Um, I will let Brandon handle facilitating questions and I will get rid of this. Great. So we do have a, a couple of questions. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, appreciate that uh, update and overview. Um, I'll read off a, a couple of questions and we'll uh, maybe let you answer them alive. So one question from Joel, uh, wondering if you see a recovery in the southern end of Lake Huron ahead of the northern end. Um. There, there are different, there's definitely differences in those two ends. Um, 
Um, and actually, before I get too far, I'll invite my uh, colleagues, Tim and, and Ed Roseman, to jump in if, if they have anything to add. Um, uh, the southern end seems to produce a lot of um, a lot of bloater biomass. Um, it's always been that way. Um, I'm not we don't really quite understand why that is, but in terms of a recovery, um, it, it's possible simply because um, um, it seems like the lake trout populations, uh, which are becoming one of the more dominant predators, are doing a little better than the northern portion of the lake than they are in the southern part, but it's, it'd be really difficult to speculate if a recovery occurs, whether that would, uh, whether a recovery would center in the northern or southern half of the lake. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question here from Laura, uh, and I think I've heard uh, you guys address this before, but gobies prefer rocky habitat, and that's not good habitat for bottom trawls, question mark. Yeah, correct, and that's uh, that's one of the reasons why the agency is um, this this coming year. I don't know what's going to happen with coronavirus, but this coming year in Lake Michigan, they were going to attempt a survey, a combined trawl and uh, AUV survey, where the AUV had a camera mounted on it. Um, they were going to try that this spring, and they were going to use the cam images from the camera as it flew over the bottom to take pictures or video of the fish that were on the bottom and they're primarily targeting ale or primarily targeting goby. Um, and so we are, the lab is developing techniques for sampling goby that way and that particular system would work over rocks. Whereas uh, your, your questioner, Laura, she's correct. The trawls do not function well over over a large rock particular, and so we do not sample over rocky habitats. Great, thanks. And then um, another, I think this is from Laura too, is the perch issue, the biomass prey fish dependent, and now a prey for others. Um, the, the time series for the yellow perch is, um, it's pretty noisy. Um, I don't know that I could draw a whole lot of conclusions about uh, yellow perch dynamics from that that time series. We only we don't we only encounter them in, in spots. So um, I think Dave Fielder would probably have uh, a better handle on where yellow perch are at in their relationship to predators. Okay, thank you. And then um, another uh, question here, and I have a comment, and we can move on. Uh, Daryl stated biomass is less in deeper waters, then why are the studies based on waters greater than 30 feet? And that's a question from Carl, who says thanks. So that's the, that's the area where the agency has, has been asked to survey. Um, as we move into this, this uh, we don't really know that the biomass is greater inside 30 feet. Um, we just suspect that a lot of the, some of the energy moving into the offshore is moving to the offshore because fish are even feeding in the inshore environment on prey fish in the inshore environment, or because some of those fish in the inshore eventually work their way into the offshore environment. Um, and uh, this is, uh, is sort of the offshore areas are sort of jurisdiction as of now. As we move into you know, a lake that looks very different from what it was historically, we are beginning to work with partners, uh, the states, uh, other agencies to think about you know, how we might combine data sources for a uh, true um, lake-wide abundance estimate and, you know, generate data that will allow us to do those kind of comparisons to determine, um, you know, how biomass changes near shore to offshore. We cover a lot of the territory, but just not all of it. And there's some uncertainty about, and in fact, there's a lot of uncertainty about what fish biomass is inside that, that 30 foot range.
So thank you, Daryl. I'm going to move us along from there. Uh, a parting comment. Uh, there was a comment that says, please uh, check in with the charters in Northern Lake Huron. Uh, a lot of talk of, of bait up there, of a lot of bait up there. So, uh, and then um, a, a question from Chris. Uh, will anybody be talking about jellyfish uh, and or where would we report sightings of jellyfish in Lake Huron or other Great Lakes? Probably not uh, on the agenda for this evening, but certainly we'll make a note of that and um, share that with the DNR Advisory Committee and others. So thank you. I'm going to move us along. Um, so thinking about that prey survey and really asking ourselves, like, how, how do these how do these fish move through the the food web in terms of the fishery uh, that we value? So when Lake Huron uh, really uh, changed pretty drastically um, due to food web changes. It became really evident and important that we needed to better understand um, how prey fish were were um, translating into to predator uh, diets. And so uh, uh, some past studies uh, have been picked up now by the MSU uh, Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, and I welcome Brian Roth. Um, a lot of you have probably collected stomachs for the study that Brian's gonna share an update for, and certainly we'll hope to have a value in, in the findings that he's got to share tonight. So with that, Brian, I'll pass, pass the reins to you. Thanks, Brandon. Um, <clears throat> thank all of you for being here and listening to an update on the predator diet study. Um, I'll just share my screen here. Okay, so you should be able to see uh, the title slide of my of my talk tonight. So um, this is a pretty substantial collaborative project that's involving a lot of folks from various agencies, including uh, Michigan DNR, USGS, US Fish and Wildlife Service, Michigan Sea Grant, um, as well as tribal agencies that are collecting diets for us. Um, we are funded by the Great Lakes Fishery Trust, um, which allowed us to substantially expand our abilities to collect predator diets. So it's really important to note that there are a lot of other contributors to this project in particular. Um, we'd really like to thank volunteer anglers and sport fishing groups. I know Frank is on the the. Uh, on the webinar tonight and he's been one of our most uh, avid collectors of stomachs for the project and other sport fishing groups have not only contributed stomachs but also donated funds to the project and we really sincerely appreciate uh, those contributions to the project they've really helped us a lot in addition michigan dnr creel agents the indiana dnr u.s fish and wildlife service technicians wisconsin sea grant uh, even Daryl contributed to the project in terms of collecting crayfish for uh, stable isotope analysis. Dave and Robin have all uh, been extremely helpful for the project. So I felt like it's really important to acknowledge those collaborators because without them, this project wouldn't happen. So if you're unaware of our project, uh, it's to determine uh, species specific diets in Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. Uh, and the idea here is to get at least Lake White on the U.S. side. Uh, <clears throat> Lake Huron is, is, of course, split between the U.S. and Canada. Um, and uh, while we would like to contribute diets from the Canadian side, uh, right now we're just focusing on the U.S. side. And so one of the things that we're, that we're after are seasonal trends in the diet composition of, of, of the predators in Lake Huron and Lake Michigan. Um, and to investigate those spatial differences. We know that habitat differs uh, depending on where you are on the lake. And so one of the things that we're interested in is how those predators are foraging uh, in those different regions. And one of the key aspects that we've, uh, that we're investigating, and this is based on not only feedback um, from anglers, but also from the scientific review is that the idea here is that we're getting a lot of our diets from, from you guys, from the anglers. However, uh, we don't know whether or not those actually represent the diets of, of all predators. And the idea here is that if you're angling, you're more than likely to catch fish that are hungry. And so because of that, they might overrepresent, say, fish with empty stomachs or fish that are foraging in a particular way. And so one of the things that we want to do is compare those angler caught diets to those fish that were caught in various surveys. And this is particularly the case for lake trout and walleye. 
that's the LAT and WAE there. And then we're also comparing this to chemical tracers of energy sources in Lake Huron um, and Lake Michigan. And these are with stable isotopes. And stable isotopes basically tell us which prey fish the, uh, the predators are foraging on, as well as where they're getting their energy, whether it be from the water column or from the bottom of the water. So of course, um, not surprisingly, all project field activities um, have been halted to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we're really in a tough spot in terms of collecting stomachs of, as of this point. And up to this time, um, there really wasn't a lot of fishing going on because motor boats weren't allowed. Now that has resumed, so we're hoping that we're gonna get a few more samples from individual fishermen. Um, should project activities resume this summer, we're really going to concentrate again on diet collection on both lakes. Uh, but then we were able to collect our stable, stable isotope samples on both lakes uh, this past fall. One of the neatest things about this project, maybe not necessarily uh, from an informative standpoint, but certainly for the scientific community, is that all these diets are entered into a unified database that's uh, uh, searchable so that we can access pretty much any individual fish that was ever ca caught as part of this survey. So to update, we've been sampling a lot of fish. Um, in 2017, we really had kind of a patchwork of funding on Lake Huron. It was funded by the United States Geological Survey. Now Lake Michigan, we really didn't have uh, a ton of funding at all. But nonetheless, we were able to collect uh, well over 1,500 diets uh, in 2018, we upped that to nearly 2,000 on Lake Huron and 2,500 on Lake Michigan. And in 2019, we're still processing our stomachs. Um, uh, of course, since we can't go out in the field, we also can't sample it, uh, analyze our diets in the lab. And so we're still analyzing our stomachs from 2019. But we've got over 1,700 from Lake Huron and 1,500 from Lake Michigan. Now that sounds like a lot, <clears throat> and I'll provide some updates from Lake Michigan in, in addition to Lake Huron, just to give you an idea of the overall scope of the project. So when we split our sampling regime up by these different statistical districts that you can see over here. And what we see is that we're able to collect uh, quite a few samples depending on the species. But if you notice here, there are some areas for which we need more samples in Lake Michigan, in particular on the Wisconsin side, uh, kind of over here. <clears throat> um, in addition, uh, the more northern parts of, of Lake Michigan require a lot more samples, in addition, Illinois. And some of this has to do with angler effort, but more likely it has to do uh, more with our ability to get those stomach samples and to get anglers to, to donate those stomachs to us. In Lake Huron, uh, we're only, again, collecting samples from the U.S. side of the lake. And we're able to cover the lake a little bit better uh, in this case. However, certain areas in particular, uh, the number of samples seem to be a little bit skewed. So for instance, here up in MH1, which is the very northern part of Lake Huron, we're catching a lot of Chinook salmon, whereas in MH4, we're not catching very many. Well, for those of you that know the lake, that makes a lot of sense because MH4 is Saginaw Bay. And we don't expect to get a lot of Chinook salmon in Saginaw Bay. Whereas up here in the north, we know that there are people fishing for and catching a lot of Chinook salmon. In fact, they're probably targeting for them. When we look through time, when we subdivide those samples by time, one of the things that may pop out to you are all these zeros here that occur in early spring, early fall, or sorry, late fall and through winter. And again, that's not necessarily because nobody's fishing, it's just because nobody's donating stomachs to us. And it's really difficult for our folks to get out and adequately sample uh, all the different ports where people are bringing these fish in. Nonetheless, we have pretty good sampling coverage on both lakes uh, through uh, mid-spring through, through early fall. So when I'm gonna talk to you about some of these results, I want you to know that uh, we've analyzed over 11,000 stomachs 
um, some from as far back as 2012, most from 2017 through 2019. And all of these stomachs are accessible on the database. We do have some gaps in species, space, and time, and some of this may have to do with where folks are placing their effort. Uh, but a lot of it also has to do with the ability to efficiently gather diets. I can't send my PhD student here, Jake Sawecki, uh, to a place where he's going to encounter uh, one or two fishermen. That's simply not really adequate when he has other things to do, including analysis uh, of these diets here in these plastic bags. So I'm going to present to you a number of different uh, sampling uh, summaries of our diet study. And I want to provide you here with the key. You'll see the, the prey species that were found in the predator diets uh, listed by these three letter abbreviations. And so ALE stands for alewife, SMT stands for rainbow smelt, RGB is round goby, COR are those bloaters in particular that Daryl spent some time on. We do see some of those in diets. I and V are invertebrates, SEU are sculpins, and o F OTH are other species which in Lake Huron particularly, we're going to refer to yellow perch. And oftentimes, particularly in the southern area, southern regions of the, of the lake, we see a lot of emerald shiners as well. And where those become particularly important, I will make sure to describe what species in particular we're talking about. <clears throat> so one of the things that we notice, oops, sorry, I went a little too fast there, is that in Lake Huron, the diets are, are very diverse depending on the species. And so what these are annual summaries of all the diets that we collected in each of those years, depending on the species. And I'll break down a number of these. However, I won't go through every single species just for the sake of time. One of the things that we do notice is that independent of the year, the diets are relatively uh, consistent. So Chinook salmon over here tend to really like alewife, right? So that's here in blue. Um, and they may add some, some smelt into their diet as well. Lake trout here tend to really like smelt and gobies in particular. And gobies are here in the kind of weird green color. Steelhead, not surprisingly, like bugs. And walleye really like gobies here in green, depending on the year. But then some uh, years, they also tend to like yellow perch. And so we'll describe that in a little bit more depth because while I have particular interest here in Lake Huron, particularly as it relates to Saginaw Bay. As it turns out, this big dark blue area here of other. So as it turns out for walleye, that's a really interesting observation that we found one walleye with about 16 Chinook salmon in their gut. For whatever reason, we, we don't know, but that tends to skew off our sample uh, when we're looking at of it when walleye in 2019. Uh, in Lake Michigan, the story is much more boring. Everyone likes alewife. Lake trout do like gobies. However, compared to Lake Michigan, uh, or sorry, Lake Huron, Lake Michigan is much less diverse um, and, and pretty homogenous. When we break these diets down by season, I'm going to compare them to uh, Lake Huron to Lake Michigan just to give you a sense of how the lakes differ. It's not a surprise, of course, that the two lakes do differ, but how they differ is of interest not only to you guys, perhaps, but also to management agencies who are seeking to understand uh, what, how these predators support themselves in, in times where there's relatively few alewife. So for Chinook salmon here, when we look at total biomass by date. So this is all the areas of the lakes combined, depending on when they were caught. Uh, we see that in Lake Michigan, again, for Chinook salmon, it's all alewife all the time. However, in Lake Huron, we see that in April, we don't actually have very many samples. So this may look like they're eating a lot of invertebrates in particular. These would be bithotrephes, the fish hook flea. Um, however, we only have about four samples from April in, in the entire three years of the study. More than likely here, when we get May, June, July, and August, these are the samples that are primarily coming from the northern area. And what we see is that they're primarily consuming either alewife or rainbow smelt, which again, shouldn't necessarily be a surprise. 
uh, to those of you targeting these fish in Lake Cod. When we look at walleye, we have to shift our view up a little bit. And this is because my former master's student, uh, Katie Kraczynski, who you may have seen in previous talks, she did a lot of these analysis for, <clears throat> for uh, many lake ground species in 2017 and 2018. And in this graph here, yellow perch is here in light yellow, alewife is in gray, brown goby is in orange. So I apologize for the, for the change in color schemes, but I, I did want to show you how these diets change through time because it's relatively consistent and interesting. So what we see is in springtime, both in 2017 and in 2018, there seems to be some sort of peak in brown goby consumption by walleye. However, that declines through time. When we look then at, say, yellow perch consumption in 2017, we see this increase going into August and then maybe declining a little bit in September in 2017. However, it tends to be relatively high um, compared to, to early spring in 2018. In, in addition, in 2018, we see that decline in round goby, but yellow perch increase as well as rainbow smelt. And we see this increase in rainbow smelt consumption across our predator species in 2018. Going back to uh, the more traditional uh, scheme for colors, when we look at lake trout, we see that they actually follow a fairly similar seasonal trend as walleye in that brown goby are incorporated much more commonly early in the year uh, than and then switch to rainbow smelt later. And we actually see that trend not only on Lake Huron, but also on Lake Michigan. Round goby are incorporated early in the year, and then they switch rather from rainbow smelt, but to alewife later. When we look at space, again, Lake Michigan, relatively uh, simple in that they're eating pretty much alewife everywhere we go. However, in Lake Huron, we see a different story. The vast majority of our samples come from these two statistical districts, which are in northern Lake Huron. These are relatively spare. And so, yes, they do appear to be eating a lot of invertebrates and MH6, but the truth is we have about two fish from that, from, from that area. The vast majority of our fish are from these areas, and not surprisingly, they're eating a lot of alewife and a lot of rainbow smell. When we look at walleye, Again, we're gonna to switch to that other uh, color phase. We see that the vast majority of our samples come from Saginaw Bay, which again, shouldn't be surprising if you know Lake Huron at all. And what we see is that uh, while I consume a lot of round goby in areas pretty much other than Saginaw Bay. So this here, MH3, which is just north of Saginaw Bay. Again, this is represented by five total fish, so we don't put a huge amount of faith in, in that number. However, when we combine them all, we see that outside of Saginaw Bay, most of these fish are consuming uh, round goby. However, in Saginaw Bay, we see an almost completely different story. Where round goby uh, don't represent nearly as high of a diet proportion, and instead they're incorporating yellow perch here in light yellow, and invertebrates here in orange. And this is, again, this occurs particularly early on when they're eating a lot of mayfly larvae, et cetera. Uh, looking at lake trout, when we look at their spatial uh, diets, we see that outside of Saginaw Bay, it should be a relatively consistent story where nearly the majority of their diet is made up of round goby, and this is, uh, in addition, rainbow smelt make up a fairly substantial part of their diet. In Lake Michigan, actually, it's pretty interesting in that what we see is that uh, on the Michigan side, lake trout incorporate some substantial numbers of round goby in their diet. However, on the Wisconsin side, that's the WM here, they're not incorporating round goby at all. And again, we are kind of beholden to the samples that we receive. So it may be that there is kind of a, um, some sort of bias in when and where we're collecting samples. So perhaps we're collecting most of our lake trout here in Lake Mich uh, on the Michigan side in springtime, whereas most of our Wisconsin diets we're collecting later in the summer and into fall when lake trout would be consuming alewife anyways. 
We don't know. These are things that we're investigating. And the reason why this study um, is so interesting uh, from a scientific standpoint, there's all these different dimensions that go to create a really dynamic story of predators consuming prey. One of the other key aspects of the data that we're collecting has to do with uh, the length of prey that we're seeing in the predator stomachs. And so here I'm showing you lake trout consumed round goby and the density, so the, this is essentially the frequency of each of these different prey sizes in lake trout stomachs and this is according to the year. So this light green here represents kind of the size frequency of round goby in, in lake trout stomachs in 2009. And this is data from a study by Ed Roseman and others in 2014 that he graciously allowed us to use as part of Katie Kurchinsky's master's thesis. And so one of the couple of interesting things that arose from this data is that it does appear in fact that they, lake trout and walleye, which both consume round goby, uh, appear to be sharing a relatively similar size of fish. However, when we uh, look at what sizes they are, what we see is that um, walleye in the early years, their prey distributions or their goby tend to peak around this, uh, this area here, which is around 60 millimeters. However, later it tends to shift a little bit larger here to this 70, uh, 70 uh, millimeter area. So what you see here is, let me just go back here. So before they're eating round gobies that were actually smaller than what lake trout were eating. But later they're actually eating gobies that are larger than what lake trout are eating. So for whatever reason, the size distribution of these prey in lake trout and walleye diets have switched, where walleye are now consuming larger round goby than lake trout are. When we look at rainbow smelt consumption, one of the key interesting stories here is that prior uh, in Ed Roseman's study, what he found is that lake trout and Chinook tended to consume different sizes of rainbow smelt. So lake trout here in the green, consumed relatively large sizes of rainbow smelt, whereas Chinook salmon tended actually to consume relatively small rainbow smelt. What we find now in 2017 and 2018 is that they're both consuming the exact same size of rainbow smelt. And so here we see that their peaks actually line up really tightly in both years. So this indicates that they're probably, whereas before they were consuming kind of a different parts of the prey size spectrum, now they're consuming the exact same spectrum. When we look at walleye consuming yellow perch, we see that prior to 2017-2018, walleye tended to consume a relatively broad size of yellow perch, which indicated they were feeding on multiple ages of yellow perch. However, now that age structure has been really constrained such that in 2017, they, the size of yellow perch peaked around 50 millimeters, and in 2018, it peaked a little bit later. So to, to conclude this aspect of the, of the project, um, clearly alewife are, are still an important prey in Northern Lake Huron, particularly for Chinook salmon. Um, lake trout and walleye are eating a lot of gobies. I actually collected the stomach here for walleye. Um, and this is particularly true in spring and early summer and in areas outside of Saginaw Bay. Um, this should say replace, <laughs> replace with fish. This should say replace with open water fish. So this would be rainbow smell and alewife later in the year. Um, for most prey species, one of the things that perhaps requires a little bit further thought is that predators seem to be feeding on a single age class of most prey species. Those humps simply were single peaked, which means that they're only feeding on one size and they tend to share uh, across species that one size of prey, which uh, may indicate some limited prey availability. And this kind of go coincides with what Daryl presented and that prey abund uh, abundances are much lower than they were historically. 
So next steps, uh, that's five question marks, and that's on purpose simply because we don't know how this year is going to go given the COVID-19 crisis, uh, simply because all our partners are, no, are not collecting diets for us, and this is uh, what we rely on for the vast majority of our diet samples so that we can get whole truckloads of stomachs like this one. And currently, we really have no way to collect stomachs, except for you. And so not only is my talk here about providing you an update, but I'm also here begging for your help. Um, even if we are allowed to travel and collect stomachs on our own, it will take some time to kind of ramp up sampling after we're able to travel again. In addition, we really do lack adequate samples for a number of species in a number of areas and a number of seasons. We know people are fishing. However, uh, what we're really hoping is that people will feel impelled to, to, to donate to our studies. So please, please, pretty please, with a cherry on top, however you want to say it, donate stomachs to the project. Um, we're really happy to provide supplies and any training. And if you need help uh, catching fish, I am really happy to help you with that. So you can go ahead and email me and uh, send me your contact information and I'll come show you how to catch fish. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so if you have any questions, I'd, I'd love to be able to answer them. Um, you may see this uh, placard. Um, however, if you are really interested in, in donating stomachs, again, we're really happy to provide you with supplies. Um, I think Brandon has contacts for our Facebook group as well as directions uh, from a Sea Grant video uh, that, that shows how to collect the stomachs and record the data in a manner that will help the project out a lot. So with that, I think Brennan's gonna navigate some of these questions and I'll, I'll be happy to answer them. Yes, uh, thanks Brian, very much appreciated. And I think mm -hmm. not only is it valuable to have sort of the summary of the work you've been doing, but again, a, a call to action for folks to uh, save their stomachs and, and help uh, contribute to this study. Yeah. Um, we're running a little short on time, but and okay. some of these questions are uh, maybe best saved to the end, so I'm not ignoring uh, your questions, but I have three. Uh, one was a question from Steve uh, with the Michigan Steelheaders Thumb Chapter. Any sign of herring in stomachs of outer Saginaw Bay predators? Uh, so, uh not many. Um, I'm trying to think exactly when. Uh, so I, I think that he's referring to Lake Herring or Cisco. Um, and, you know, they're just not that common in predator stomachs. Um, and, and I think Daryl alluded to that earlier. Even in Lake Michigan, I mean, on both lakes, yes, we do find them. Um, but, but they're just not super common. Um, and, and that's just uniformly. We don't know why that is. Maybe they're faster. Maybe they're smarter. Maybe they behave in a manner that eludes predators better. Uh, but we just, we just don't know necessarily. Thanks. Uh, another, uh, and I know you addressed this in a Lake Michigan session, but what invertebrates were common in diets uh, and what predators were they associated with? Yeah, so steelhead eat a ton of bugs. I mean, a ton, ton, ton of bugs. Um, and so I think early on in the, particularly um, on one of these slides, I showed an example. So I'm just gonna kind of hopefully kind of quick go back. There, there it is. So here on my screen, um, I'm showing like an example of a steelhead diet. And so in this one, you can see there's actually like wasps. Uh, that's a fairly common bug. There's beetles in there as well. Um, it, for whatever reason, Chinook salmon tend to eat a lot of uh, the fish hook flea, Bifitrephes. But it just depends on, you know, what lands on the water that day that you see. In walleye, they'll eat a lot of mayfly larvae. Um, so it, it really just depends. Thank you. And uh, there's some uh, additional great questions. I'm hoping maybe, Brian, you can uh, reply in, 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 in writing and, and, and everybody can see the questions and your response. Absolutely. Uh, 
the parting question I have is uh, if we know when freezers will be open to drop off samples. Uh, some folks have uh, some stomachs in their freezers already, just looking for a place to drop them. That is fantastic. And as soon as we know when those freezers are going to open, we will post that on our Facebook page. Um, there may have been some movement on that, but we don't necessarily, we receive updates from our partners regarding when freezers are going to be available and where they're going to be available. And so we reach out from time to time to try to figure that out. And so it's probably time to do that now that some of the restrictions have been listed on, on traveling and fishing and stuff like that. And so we will make sure to post those as soon as we're able to. Great. Thanks, Brian. Again, uh, thanks again to Brian Roth from the MSU uh, Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. Really appreciate uh, your contributions. And if you're sticking around, we'll circle back to some of these questions uh, towards the end. Yep. Uh, for now, um, I'd like to move us up the food chain. Uh, and I'm going to introduce uh, Todd Wills uh, from the DNR uh, Fisheries Research Station. And um, this is sort of an annual opportunity to check in on the catch and creel and kind of look at how our Lake Huron fishery performed in the past and maybe uh, uh, think about some of those opportunities and expectations that we can look forward to in, in this coming uh, fishing season. So with that, I will introduce Todd Wills. Good evening. Before I begin tonight's update on Lake Huron's offshore fishery, I think it's helpful to define exactly what a fishery is. A fishery is the interaction between fish, habitat, and people, which in the case of the Great Lakes and its connecting waters results in major social and economic benefits for Michigan. When we speak of a fishery and fisheries management, we're talking about these three things collectively. Tonight's talk will tell the story of the Maine Basin fishery through a combination of data from our charter reporting and angler survey or creel programs. I also think it's helpful to begin by providing background on the changes that have occurred in Lake Huron in the 1990s and 2000s to help set the stage and provide greater context for what we've observed in the Maine Basin fishery. This 50,000 foot level overview of how the current conditions in Lake Huron came to be begins with the introduction of invasive zebra and quagga mussels. This created a perfect storm, which led to a decrease in offshore prey through fundamental changes in nutrients and energy flow, which was exacerbated by increased predation pressure from naturally reproducing Chinook salmon. We're all very familiar with the results of these broad ecosystem changes, like the disappearance of alewives in the mid 2000s and the resulting crash of the Chinook salmon population. The changes we've experienced in Lake Huron have undoubtedly had an economic impact to the local communities and have left some questioning whether it's worth a trip to try fishing the lake. The fishery has indeed changed, but it's thriving with the resurgence of native species like Lake Trout and Walleye, with many other species that add diversity to the catch. Let's look first at the data from our charter fishery and a little background on how we collect this information. Charter operators are required to report their effort, catch, harvest, and release to the DNR each year. We don't survey our charter operators, but instead we compile annual summaries of the data they report to us. Let's begin with a summary of charter effort. Main base and charter fishing effort during 2019, about 25,500 angler hours, continued a stable trend that began in 2016. Charter effort during the past four years also remains above the contemporary average of 22,300 angler hours, which is represented by the black line. Note that the changes to the Lake Huron ecosystem that have occurred since 2005 can be considered the new normal. So it's more representative to focus on trends during the last 15 years, which I'll continue to do throughout this talk. I use harvest as one of the primary measures of fishery performance in this talk, since the main basin fishery is harvest oriented, with the exception of tributary fisheries for steelhead and Atlantic salmon. Harvest in the main basin charter fishery mirrors total charter effort, which is represented by the black line, Total harvest in 2019 was just over 10,500 fish, which is about 10% lower than 2018. Salmon and trout continue to comprise the largest component of charter harvest, followed by walleye. Yellow perch have been a relatively minor component of charter harvest. Note that the salmon and trout category includes Atlantic salmon and pink salmon for the first time in 2019. In contrast to the charter reporting program, 
The CREEL program is a survey. We station CREEL clerks at ports in order to interview non-charter recreational anglers as they finish their fishing trips. The clerks are also responsible to count the number of people or boats that are fishing at scheduled times. Counts are like taking a snapshot of fishing at a given place and time and can also be done by plane. Using the interviews and counts, the CREEL program estimates how many hours people spend fishing, how many and what species of fish they harvested and released, and what the catch, harvest, and release rates are for each species from year to year. We estimate this information because we only sample a proportion of the actual anglers that are out there. First, here's some big picture data to address the question, where does Lake Huron fit in relative to the other Great Lakes? Lake Huron, in this slide, the main basin and Saginaw Bay, accounted for a third of Michigan's total Great Lakes angling effort in 2019. This was more than the effort in Michigan waters of Lake Sinclair, Lake Erie, and Lake Superior combined. In a similar comparison of total catch, Lake Huron, again the main basin in Saginaw Bay in this slide, accounted for almost a third of the total catch in Michigan waters of the Great Lakes. This was equal to Lake Michigan and exceeded Lake Superior, Erie, and St. Clair. Let's focus in on the main basin fishery for the remainder of the presentation, since this is an offshore talk. Only main basin ports are included for the following summary slides. The St. Mary's River and Saginaw Bay are not. Data are pooled across all site sampling in a given year to provide the big picture. Estimated recreational fishing effort during 2019 ranged from a low of about 800 angler hours at Hammond Bay to a high of about 55,000 angler hours at Drummond Island. The Lachino Islands and Rogers City are high effort ports in the north, while Alpena and Oscoda received the highest effort mid-lake. Lexington followed Harbor Beach and Port Sandalac in the south. Main base and non-charter recreational fishing effort during 2019, about 280,000 angler hours, was the lowest in the contemporary time series, falling 8% from 2018, similar to charter effort, and below the contemporary average represented by the black line. This decrease in effort isn't unique to Lake Huron. Across Michigan waters of the Great Lakes, angling effort fell by about 7% in 2019. For perspective, non-charter recreational angling effort fell the most in Lake Sinclair, about 40%, and Lake Erie, about 20%. Salmon and trout were the major sources of non-charter recreational targeted effort during the late 1990s and early 2000s. After the food web changes in the mid 2000s, more effort in the main basin has shifted to walleye and yellow perch. Targeted salmon and trout and walleye effort in 2019 were both similar to 2018. The decrease in non-charter effort in 2019 was due to less yellow perch effort which was also observed in other Great Lakes. It doesn't appear that the observed decline in non-charter recreational fishing effort in the main basin is due to a shift in effort to Saginaw Bay. While lakewide effort, which is represented by the blue line, has declined, Saginaw Bay effort, represented by the red line, has consistently accounted for about 60 to 80% of lakewide effort over the past 15 years. The proportion of angling effort directed to Saginaw Bay did increase around 2004-2005 when the major change in the Lake Huron ecosystem occurred. Similar to the charter fishery, non-charter recreational salmon and trout harvest closely mirrors main basin targeted angler effort, which is represented by the black line. Chinook salmon, lake trout, and rainbow trout are important species to the fishery and have historically comprised the largest component of the salmon and trout harvest and continue to do so. Non-charter salmon and trout total harvest during 2019 was about 20,000 fish, which is 7,000 fish below the time series average. A highlight for 2019 is that Michigan stocked coho salmon for the first time since 1989. A total of 175,000 fish were stocked, 50,000 yearlings at Alpena and Port Sanilac, and 75,000 fall fingerlings at Port Hope. Stocking for 2020 has already taken place at the Asalba River and Harbor Beach. 50,000 yearlings were stocked at each location. I'd like to focus in on Atlantic salmon for a moment as they weren't included in the previous summary slide. Atlantic salmon harvest has been variable during the past 15 years. And for reference, I've included the number of fish stocked, which is represented by the black line. The harvest in 2019 was a little more than 1,500 fish, which is above the contemporary average for the second year in a row. The fishery continues to grow in popularity beyond Lake Huron, with catches being reported throughout the St. Clair Detroit River system. 
Now it's important to note that this slide is based solely on the Creel program, which has some inherent weaknesses for documenting Atlantic salmon, such as poor spread on the Asalva River and the lack of a Creel past November. Catch and release is also not reflected. The return of coated wire tagged Atlantic salmon heads confirms that the Creel underestimates this fishery. Harvest rates are another useful measure for fishery performance because they account for effort rather than just raw numbers of fish. Overall harvest rates, the number of fish harvested per angler hour of effort for salmon and trout have been near or above the contemporary average represented by the black line during the past five years. The salmon and trout harvest rate was up in 2019 and is the second highest in the time series, just below 2016. Well, let's shift the tension away from salmon and trout for a moment, discuss walleye, which have responded very well to the ecosystem changes in Lake Huron. And their recovery in Saginaw Bay is a perfect example. Main base and walleye harvest in 2019 was about 8,500 fish, which is comparable to 2018. Now remember that effort drives harvest and targeted walleye effort in the main basin, which again is represented by the black line, has been highly variable. During 2019, targeted effort was also similar to 2018. Overall harvest rates for walleye in the main basin have varied. While below the contemporary average represented by the black line, the 2019 walleye harvest rate of about 0.03 fish per hour was higher than 2018 and is on par with levels observed during many of the past 15 years. In summary, charter effort and harvest have been stable and above average during the past four years. Harvest mirrors effort. While the non-charter recreational fishery saw a decrease in effort, this isn't unique to Lake Huron. Harvest also mirrors effort for the non-charter fishery, so it's no surprise that harvest mostly decreased in 2019. Lake trout remained the largest part of the harvest, and overall salmon and trout harvest rates are up. The anglers that are investing the time to fish are being rewarded. Finally, Lake Huron continues to support a diverse fishery. Anglers continue to harvest lake trout, Chinook salmon, rainbow trout, Atlantic salmon, and coho salmon. The new coho salmon stocking program will create more opportunity. And don't forget about the opportunities provided by walleye, as well as other species like yellow perch and smallmouth bass, which are not mentioned here, when fishing the main basin. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Todd. I appreciate uh, that summary, and um, I think, I'm not seeing any questions rolling in at this point. All right, well, if there are no questions at this point, I'll say thanks again uh, to Todd Wills uh, from the DNR Fisheries uh, Research Station and wanted to move into uh, uh, Cisco restoration in Lake Huron, talk with Chris Olds from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So uh, Chris, uh, many of you on the, in the Lake Huron community have for a long time been a part of this conversation and opportunity to think about how do we uh, look at Cisco restoration as an opportunity for Lake Huron, not only in contributing to the prey base, but potentially also uh, enhancing some fishing, fishing oppor opportunities as well. So Chris uh, and Fish, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have been at the heart of, of the, the most current uh, conversations and work, and Chris is joining us to share um, where this project is in uh, going. With that, Chris, I'll pass the reins to you. Thanks. Well, good evening, everybody. I honestly say that uh, this is definitely a first for me and uh, probably a first for many of you. But uh, thanks to, to Brandon and the Michigan Sea Grant and uh, Michigan State University Extension Office for, for making this possible. Um, for tonight's talk, I'm going to update you on uh, some of the Cisco work that's going on uh, in Lake Huron. And so we're going to go through some of the Cisco rehabilitation activities. And I want to walk through some of the um, just the different steps of how we're getting to where we're at. And so starting out with the egg production, where and how we get our eggs to when they're in the hatchery and we get the, the fry and, and the different life stages that we're, we're rearing those fish to. And then go to um, the stocking and how we're getting them to the, the, the lake. And then kind of the, the, the highlight of this talk for me is, is talking about how we can get you guys, the anglers and commercial fishermen, engaged with the, um, the success of this program. So we're going to start off with uh, the Cisco Restoration Plan, just to, again, remind you uh, and others of what, what exactly we're trying to do. 
So the risk restoration plan calls for a annual stocking of 1.1 million uh, spring and fall fingerlings. And that is uh, the two life stages that we've that have been identified that we're trying to raise these uh, Cisco uh, up to. And each fish has an internal mark um, that allows us to identify that fish as a hatchery fish. Um, those fish are fed with a, an antibiotic uh, that binds to a, the calcified structures or the bones. And we're able to take those fish uh, after you catch them or different management agencies collect them and put them under a microscope with a special light and we'll see a, a ring fluoresce on that bone. And so what we do is if that fish has a single ring, then we know that fish was stocked in the spring because all of our spring stock fish get one mark. And then if it, the fish was released in the fall, it would have two marks because we put give that fish uh, two treatments of this uh, antibiotic. And so we get uh, two good marks. And so not only are we able to identify those fish as a hatchery fish, but we can also age that fish to identify um, what year that fish was stocked and, and raised in the hatchery system. So it's a really good way to assess the survival of either the spring life stage or the fall life stage. Um, the restoration plan also calls for uh, the eggs to come from a Lake Huron source. And so we collect the eggs from uh, two northern Lake Huron sources, uh, which I'll get into a little bit later. And so <clears throat> the objectives for this project is to assess whether these cultured Cisco can survive to maturity. Um, that's one of the big unknowns. It's, it's not been done to uh, this scale before. Um, and then also do the, the mature Cisco that are uh, put into these different stocking areas around Saginaw Bay, primarily Whitestone Point, um, do they home? So do they come back to the area where they were stocked um, for spawning purposes? Similar to the, the same concept of, of the many salmon and trout species that are, that are stocked into the Great Lakes that uh, when they, you know, when the tributaries that they're stocked into, do they come back to that tributary to, to spawn? Uh, we also want to be able to detect natural reproduction from the mating of cultured cisco. So once these fish are stocked, do they, do they survive to maturity? And do they come back to for spawning purposes? And when they do come back, those eggs, can we detect their survival in the springtime when they hatch? So again, another big objective to this. And then lastly is value the dispersal of the stock cisco um, from the stocking area. So like I said, these fish are stocked near Whitestone Point. Um, at, at both in the spring and the fall. And so do these fish stay around Whitestone Point or do they go into inner Saginaw Bay? Do they stay in outer Saginaw Bay but go around the Charity Islands? Do they go to Port Huron, Ontario, or do they travel uh, back northward towards maybe Thunder Bay? So those are some of the objectives that we're trying to get out of this uh, restoration plan that hopefully with your help, we can get some answers to. So now I just want uh, to highlight the 2019 stocking activities um, that occurred this last fall. So stocking occurred over four nights in early October. Um, we stocked just shy of 691,000 fall fingerlings. Um, the average size of those uh, Cisco was about 3.4 inches. And if, if you like your units in metric, that's about 25.4 millimeters. And so if we take our fall stocking and combine it with our spring stocking, our total number of Cisco that were stocked into Saginaw Bay this year was about 1.15 million fish. So a very successful year. We met our, our target and, and uh, goals for this year. Um, again, this is uh, the second year, or uh, the first year of stocking was 2018. And so this is our second um, successful uh, production year. We're, we're really excited about that. And we're moving into to year three here now in 2020. And so in the picture, in the map on the lower left there, you'll see the, the red star. And that is the actual stocking location of where these Cisco are going. And then the black dots indicate historical spawning locations um, that Cisco had uh, used to spawn at um, in Saginaw Bay. So again, uh, part of the, the question is, will they come back to that area where there's suitable habitat to spawn? And then the two pictures on the, the lower right there, we have the offshore stocking vessel, the MV Spencer F. Baird, which is one of the techniques that we use to um, stock Cisco, where we were able to get them a little bit further offshore. 
And then the last picture here on the right is uh, us stocking those fish at night and uh, we're you know, holding it, we're hold the um, hatchery manager is holding a tube out in the water with uh, lights on to kind of simu simulate the moon and uh, how it attracts the fish. And so it keeps the fish offshore. And it's just one way we're able to, again, maximize survival of these stock Cisco into Saginaw Bay. Now I'll identify, uh, go through some of the uh, fall gamete collections uh, from this past fall uh, in 2019. So wild gamete collections uh, occur at two different sites. And the first site that I'll, I want to talk about is Drummond Island. And so there's two uh, bays that we collect uh, gametes from. Uh, the first one is on the north side of the island, that's Potagannising Bay. Um, some of these different islands have really great spawning habitat. And then the, the second site is Whitney Bay. And Whitney Bay is where we got a majority of our eggs from this year. And so the spawning season actually began November 11th and was concluded by, um, our, our part was at least concluded by November 16th. Um, spawning began on Drummond Island first. Uh, the water had, lake had turned over enough that it allowed a lot of the cold water from the main lake uh, to get up into the embayments. And uh, the timing was right, temperature was right, and uh, spawning began a little bit early, earlier, that is, the, to the second site. The second site that we normally collect uh, gametes uh, at is the Lachino Islands. And so this year we were able to collect some gametes in the Hessel area, identified there uh, in, by the black box uh, around Hessel. And any of you deer hunters uh, may remember that uh, the opening day of deer season this year was uh, a cold one to remember. And for us, this was our coldest Cisco spawning season to date. And uh, as you can see there in the picture of me and my colleagues, on November 11th and 12th, uh, that is uh, Government Bay behind us, um, but that's another area we used to usually work, try to work in uh, outside of Cedarville. And uh, overnight into uh, you know the 11th and 12th, uh, Government Bay formed about three to four inches of ice, uh, which uh, prohibited us from going out and doing our, our collections. And so we resorted to working at our alternate site, which was over in Hessel. But uh, spawning actually began later in Hessel, and it didn't begin until about November 14th. However, by that time, um, the hatchery needs were already met by the, the crew that was collecting eggs uh, over on Drummond Island. And so uh, what we, we were left to do is just help with some other ancillary collections, if you will. Um, we continued to collect Cisco for a movement study uh, where we collected um, 50 Cisco from the Western Lake New Islands near Hessel. Uh, to help identify other additional spawning areas and look at the movement. And so I've got a shameless plug for uh, Dr. Todd Hayden, who's a research biologist with the USGS. He, he has got a fantastic uh, movement study that he's going to be presenting at the Lachino Island Workshop Thursday, May 21st. Um, and he's got some incredible animations that show um, movement, uh, almost daily movement of the Cisco throughout the year. And it was really um, an eye-opening experience for us to kind of uh, get uh, a better idea of what these fish are doing year-round. And so that's what led to this year, which was our second year of that study, uh, where we tagged fish from both, uh, more fish from uh, Hessel and also uh, the Eastern National Islands around Government Bay. So just to summarize our 2019 Cisco uh, egg collections, we collected roughly 22 liters of eggs uh, over that five days. Uh, which gives us about 2.2 million green eggs. Uh, the initial IAP was well above 80%, so we're, we're really uh, happy with that, and we'll continue to see how the development uh, occurs um, here into the spring. Those eggs uh, are, have, were reared at two different water temperatures, so six and four degrees Celsius, and the warmer six degree temperatures for the spring stock fish. We wanna be able to uh, achieve a larger body size um, for those fish to have a better chance of survival. And uh, so those fish were held at a warmer temperature uh, versus the fall fish. And once those fish are stocked into Saginaw Bay, it gives us uh, greater capacity within the hatchery to spread out the fall, um, fall cohort and use the warm summer months to heat up that water a little bit to allow them to also then achieve a larger body size heading into the fall. So now we're gonna, I wanna, just highlight some of the post stocking activities and this is where uh, you as anglers and commercial fishermen really can and, uh, play a role in, in helping us assess uh, the success of this Cisco stocking and rehabilitation back in the southern Lake Huron. 
So hopefully as many of you start going to the different ports uh, around Lake Huron and meeting with the, the krill, uh, krill clerks and uh, um, the fish clean, going to the fish cleaning stations, hopefully you'll be seeing a lot more of these posters. And these posters are just seeking your help. And uh, we've already been able to see uh, some limited success by the stocking events through uh, commercial bait fishermen that uh, captured Cisco in their bait seines uh, around Tawas and Augre, and, uh, and that's just a really encouraging sign. And so uh, we've provided two different options here uh, for anglers. If you, uh, if you capture a Cisco and uh, you're willing to provide the whole fish, there's a whole suite of data that we can collect from that fish. Um, or if you wanted to, to save the fish in, in the fillet, we, we completely understand that, but you can clip or re remove that chunk of meat, which is called the caudal peduncle, um, outlined by this, uh, this uh, dotted red box around the tail fin. And we can, if you collect, remove that and freeze it, and you can drop it off at one of the Michigan DNR offices identified there in the bottom, you can uh, turn that in and provide your contact information. And when we take that fish and look for that OTC mark and identify the age of that fish, we can return, uh, provide you some of that uh, information back and to help you, again, just to help identify where these fish are coming from. Because all of this will, again, help answer some of those objectives of looking to see how old these fish are, are, are becoming after, they're, after they've been stocked, which life stage is surviving uh, better, the spring or the fall, and then look at the movement. Uh, you know, are these fish moving away from Saginaw Bay or are they staying within kind of the outer bay or inner bay limits of Saginaw Bay? So just a couple of great options for you to be able to uh, assist. And again, uh, we look forward to working with you uh, on this project here into, into the future. Not only are we asking anglers and commercial fishermen to assist, but we also have a lot of the management agencies that are going to be conducting um, surveys uh, that will also aid in um, evaluating some of our objectives that we have identified. So there's a larval uh, survey that will be looking at uh, egg survival and, and looking for the fry or the, the baby uh, cisco that would have hatched from those uh, reproducing cisco in Saginaw Bay. Again, the red star there indicates the spawning site, or the, me, the stocking site of cisco into Saginaw Bay, and then the black dots around it uh, are all historical spawning locations. So we're going to be looking um, this fall and summer for Cisco utilizing these areas for looking for food availability and for spawning uh, purposes. Um, we also have the, uh, an acoustic survey that's conducted by Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, United States Geological Service, and Michigan DNR that occurs throughout multiple time series or time points throughout the summer um, within Saginaw Bay and Lake Huron that looks for prey fish but also looking for um, Cisco, which fall under that prey fish category. So lots of, uh, lots of fantastic work going on in Saginaw Bay, and uh, we are really excited about this program and, and seeing um, how these fish uh, help benefit the Saginaw Bay fish community into the, going into the future. And so with that, I have to thank all of our fantastic partners that help uh, support this project and whether it be evaluations, reviewing documents, um, or providing input into, into this, uh, this terrific program. And with that, I'd like to open it up to any questions that you may have. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Chris. We appreciate that uh, overview. And I don't see any questions at this point, uh, but I'm gonna give folks a minute. Um, and I, I know Tom had a question relating to Cisco, um, you know, just asking about the goals of, of uh, restoration for Cisco and, and really kind of alluding to the, or wondering about the expectations for them showing up in, in stomach, stomach samples. And so that uh, relates to some of what uh, Brian just shared and um, also Dave addressed, Dave Fielder from the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. Uh, fisheries research station that address that also to expand the multiple goals that go with this program that you just outlined Chris okay so some questions coming in uh, Steve uh, what will eat Cisco great question so uh, Cisco are a native uh, prey species in Lake Huron and so a lot of the top level predators including lake trout uh, walleye um, you know, will definitely prey uh, on Cisco, including your, your burbot species as well. So those are just a few, um, you know, top level predators that will eat Cisco, uh, yep. that will benefit from the Cisco. 
and people will eat Cisco. Absolutely. So uh, a question here also from Dan, what is a Cisco? And I, I think I'll, I'll start that off by uh, mo most of us will uh, know Cisco uh, as uh, Lake Herring. Uh, they were renamed um, and then, you know, they're really in the, the Salmonid family. So they're uh, most closely related to uh, whitefish and, and bloaters and, and that subfamily. Um, how old, uh, Chris, would a two-year-old Cisco be? Two-year-old Cisco would be two years old. Um, but if it's if your question is about the how, length, how large? How large? I'm sorry. Yep. <laughs> That's Thank okay. You. So uh, the length of a of a two-year-old Cisco could be uh, depending on food availability and the you know water temperature and everything like that. You could see them upwards of uh, eight to nine inches. Thanks. And then the last question I'll throw here at you is what strain of Cisco are we currently stocking? It is a, it is a Lake Huron uh, strain. Like I said, that comes from Northern Lake Huron. Um, some people will call it a short head form uh, because it's uh, got a, a shorter head and a little deeper body than um, uh, the other, other form, which is a little more cylindrical um, that would you know, be also found in Lake Huron. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, with that, uh, I'll move us along in our program. Again, thank you, Chris Olds from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for sharing that update on uh, this exciting uh, Lake Herring or Cisco restoration project. So uh, time flies when we're talking fish. Uh, we're here uh, to the end, and traditionally we've uh, used this last portion of the program to introduce uh, the Lake Huron uh, managers. So I'm going to introduce Randy Claremont. Um, who is the Lake Huron Basin Coordinator. And Randy uh, has a few updates to share. And then certainly, uh, if you have any management uh, questions, uh, it would be a great time to ask them now. So Randy? Good evening, everybody. And thank you for attending the Open Water Fisheries Sea Grant Workshop. Uh, as you can see, today was wonderful. We had an excellent number of presentations, um, really good information about the fisheries. I'm Randy Claremont, the Lake Huron Basin Coordinator for MDNR, and I just want to talk briefly before we open up to general questions um, on management updates. And as most people are aware, it's been a challenging spring. With the implications from COVID-19, we've had to reduce a lot of our activities and this included our spring egg take so for the spring of 2020 we were not able to uh, collect any walleye muskie steelhead or arctic grayling eggs for our rearing programs and this will have implications both in 2020 and 2021 um, staff are doing everything in, the, in their power to um, gear up for the fall egg takes in hopes that normal operations resume. In addition, the, the stocking of fish that were already in the system um, was also modified. Lake trout stocking at near shore sites were consolidated. Um, many steelhead stocking sites were consolidated, so some did not receive fish so that we could limit the travel time and exclude any overnight travel that would normally be associated with some of the uh, sites that are far away from our rearing facilities. Also, the marking was frozen partway through our Atlantic salmon. The steelhead were marked. Um, however, depending on the fish species and the year class or the life stage, the fish may have been only partially marked or not marked at all. Um, and this included, for example, all the Chinook salmon that we've been marked just recently uh, will not receive a mark and are going out as we speak. Also, our creel and fisheries assessments were either delayed or entirely canceled. Um, it is with great sadness and um, uh, unfortunate situation that I have to communicate that right now, 43% of our staff are in temporary layoffs because of the implications from COVID-19. Uh, that's a two-week um, layoff that we hope to get those critical staff back and resume normal operations as soon as possible. Although we are expecting that budget strains and stresses will continue and um, our restrictions on our activities will likely uh, be looming in the future depending on multiple factors. As most of you are aware, there was uh, no charter and motorboat um, under an executive order for most of April. Therefore, we had reduced effort and catch seen across the fisheries in Lake Huron. 
These motorboat restrictions have been lifted, although uh, the charter and guide fisheries still haven't resumed, and we're looking for um, relief from that soon or in uh, mid-May, hopefully. Uh, sea lamprey control is also delayed, and this will have implications should those delays um, continue into actually eliminating the sea lamprey control. We, we don't have word of that yet, but we're paying very close attention to what the implications might be for sea lamprey control, and our hopes are that we will be able to resume at full activities um, as soon as possible and, and uh, have the control implemented. We want to say that angler participation in support of um, uh, all of our fisheries programs is is even more critical now than ever have been. We started um, last year a coho stocking program, which I will uh, talk about in the future. And it, we were looking to get creel information and initial information on the success of that coho stocking program. But with the creel, fish, creel and our fisheries assessments being canceled, it was really the anglers giving us feedback when they could fish on what they're seeing that's been extremely beneficial. So please um, continue to participate and provide your feedback through these type of workshops and through other uh, avenues or menus that are invaluable to us in managing your fishery. Um, as I mentioned, the coho, last year we initiated a, a stocking program up to 100,000 coho. We split that, that stocking allocation in half. So half of those are um, stocked north of Saginaw Bay, half in the south. We'll do that every year. However, we're going to rotate between sites. So the sites in the south last year were Port Sanilac, and in the north were Thunder Bay River. Um, this coming spring, coho were stocked out at Harbor Beach in the south and then at the Asable River in the north. Um, we had a prediction of how fast those would be growing. We were seeing fish caught as early as January in southern Lake Huron, and they were exactly on our predicted growth models and looking very healthy. And, and um, we saw fish started to show up in February and March, just as you'd predict, in very good numbers. Limit catches of coho being caught. And then when the motorboat um, restrictions came online, um, we had a gap. But as soon as those were lifted, we got reports again that those uh, coho are being caught in good numbers and first indications that the coho stocking program has produced a fishery. So again, very thankful and glad to see that happen. Um, we're going to be talking about regulation changes in our upcoming May 7th conversations and coffee. Let's talk fish in Lake Huron. So in addition to these fisheries workshops, I encourage you to uh, register for this the, at the link attached. Uh, reach out to us. It's a one hour. Um, you know, really get our biologists and our unit managers on the phone, ask some questions about uh, anything in the guidebook that you have in terms of seasons, limits, and we'd be glad to answer those for Lake Huron. Looking forward to that conversation in addition to these. Uh, some example topics um, are MH1 lake trout bag limits. It, um, just effective immediately now. The limit has returned to three fish. It was two, and um, it's changed in the online guide. So we'll walk through how things printed in the guide might change even during a fishing season, how to access that online fishing guide and see um, uh, rules and regulations that might have changed uh, after the guide was printed. And um, the MH1 Lake Trout bag limit returning to three fish for this fishing year, 2020, is a good example of that. We'll also be talking about, about party fishing limits and considering um, should we combine the daily possession limit for all fish caught in a party or in a boat um, and what that means for you as an angler and for law enforcement and biology uh, example topics at the conversations and coffee. Last, I just wanted to make sure that you are all aware we were able to hire um, some new staff at our Bay City office. So we have offices in Gaylord that Dave Borgeson, a unit manager, an excellent staff that have been there, well-seasoned staff, can answer all your questions. But at the Bay City office, we had had um, our unit manager and our two biologists um, collectively over 100 years of fisheries experience 
in uh, 2020 um, retire, and we were able to hire new um, staff, including unit manager Jeff Jolly, um, biologist Addie Dutton, and biologist Jason Gusto. So we're extremely happy to have uh, these extremely talented people on board, and uh, I encourage you to reach out to Jeff and his biologists if you have questions about Southern Lake Huron and fisheries management um, in that unit. And with that, Brandon, it's back to you, and I'm looking forward to some great discussions. Thanks, Randy. Um, so at this point, you know, Randy's kind of in the hot seat. Um, I would also invite any of the other panelists or presenters to uh, feel free to weigh in as questions come in. Uh, we have a good uh, 10 minutes here until 8 o'clock, and so we'll, we'll ask some questions that, that are, are on the docket uh, and can circle back to any other questions that uh, folks uh, um, would like to, to ask. So, um, Oh, I was just going to jump in. I can yep. knock a couple off real quickly. Somebody asked about how many Chinook salmon we planted this year. The answer to that is we're not done planting. Um, the target is around 670,000 Chinook salmon, um, but we're in the midst of uh, stocking right now. So just to kind of answer that question, somebody also asked about brown trout stocking, if we should reinstate brown trout. Um, in response to that is we are working closely with our Citizens Fisheries Advisory Committee on how to manage all trout and salmon in the open water make sure our stocking policies are in balance with the prey fish production. Brown trout is one of those species we, we have discussed at length, uh, continue to consider, but right now we're looking at the current diversity and the current stocking levels really being in balance with um, the prey fish community. Even the coho that were stocked last year and will continue to be stocked were done so with a modest cut in Chinook salmon to make sure that we didn't throw off that predator-prey balance. So adding more uh, brown trout to the system right now is probably uh, not advantageous, but we appreciate the comments. So just two I saw that I could probably knock off the list for you. Yeah, and on the topic of uh, fish stocking, uh, Joel says, nice work on the coho plant in Lake Huron, having a blast with great numbers and, and folks talking about them, so. Yeah, really glad to see those pictures and reports. They're just fantastic. Yep. Um, so a couple of questions here. Um, uh, one relates to, has there been any talk, any talk of making it legal to return fish offal back into the lake? Yeah, that issue comes up um, periodically. And um, I really believe a unified position from sports uh, men and women in Michigan would help. Um, other states do allow it. Wisconsin allows it. Um, you know, and we hear a lot about limited nutrients and this would be one way to mitigate those. So um, uh, the unfortunate thing is that oftentimes when this issue is raised, there's various opinions about it. Some people are worried, I don't go into harbors or they won't be far offshore. So again, uh, if this is one where the sportsmen and women came up with a reasonable proposal, we're unified behind it, we would certainly consider it and vet it through the appropriate channels. Great, thanks. Uh, another uh, question from Grant, um, have you considered self-reporting cards to augment uh, the Creel surveys? Yeah, there's, there's a number of ways to get uh, fishery independent data. Um, one of the things that I want to say, uh, or I'm sorry, fishery dependent data or Creel information from anglers. Um, our Creel survey has been through about six different reviews through its inception and is probably one of the best Creel programs in the nation. And we did that because we wanted reliable estimates on catch and effort so we can compare trends as Todd Wills presented today. Um, we can certainly get a lot of information we do and, I, and I, we don't object to that, but um, I, I, I really worry in the future about uh, losing some of the accuracy in our catch and effort data if we move to more qualitative ways. And we might have to, but if we can maintain a, a solid scientific based krill program, it's in the best interest of as us as managers and for you as sportsmen and women. Great. I'll throw one more uh, regulatory question at you and then we can end with a question for all all uh, the cormorant situation. So we'll be addressing uh, cormorant management updates during the Lachino Island uh, area workshop. Uh, that's definitely of interest to those uh, communities in that area. But do you want to provide a quick overview of cormorant management? 
put me on the spot there, Brandon. Um, yeah, this is uh, uh, an issue with a lot of history, and um, to it probably wouldn't do its service to try to summarize everything that has happened both prior to the 2016 court order limiting or, or limiting our ability to uh, uh, work with the federal uh, partners on managing cormorants, but also all that has happened since 2016 and where we're at. Um, I'll give you some quick facts. Uh, our quota for controlling cormorants in the Great Lakes, I'm sorry, in Michigan waters of the Great Lakes last year was 3,030 3, birds, so pretty minimal. We had to do so on very limited basis, protection of private property or public property, human health and safety concerns, threatened and endangered species, et cetera, but non-fisheries impacts basically. So anything that didn't, that was outside of fisheries where we're mostly concerned about birds eating fish and the fisheries impacts. Um, this year we're at, we actually have a double quota. So we're gonna uh, look to control or, or um, uh, assert some control on, on cormorants at, at around 6,000 birds. But again, um, we're trying to work up to a, more, a better framework of managing both the, the cormorants at a sustainable level, but also the fisheries impacts. And there's a lot of progress we made. There was a lot of information put out there that uh, the public could voice their opinion um, on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service website as they're looking as a public scoping process to develop management policies moving forward. So stay engaged, stay involved. Please comment on, on those. Um, we're getting there, but it's going to take some some uh, some time, and um, hopefully we'll have a better framework that will be um, sustainable and also defensible in court. Great, thanks. Um, I have uh, actually one other question. Uh, any new information on Chinook natural reproduction in northern uh, Canadian tributaries? Um, no, kind of limited information. Um, what I can say was we've been arguing uh, for a mass marking program in Lake Huron. Um, I, I would love to see us get to a point where every predator stock in Lake Huron has a AD clip and a cutter wire tag. We're about halfway away from that, but when working towards it, um, our Chinook salmon were uh, to be uh, not to be marked, and we were able to argue for the last couple of years to get those fish both 80 clipped and coated wire tagged. Um, unfortunately, um, on the Canadian side, we didn't have similar um, marking, so we had a gap there in the last couple of years, and then this year with COVID 19 all the Chinook salmon being stocked will not have uh, AD clip or quota wire tag. So um, yeah, it's, it's something we don't want to lose our handle on. Uh, natural reproduction can certainly drive wild uh, um, estimates of predator prey balance, but we're doing the best we can to try to make it a priority. It's um, something that again, anglers are going to need to say is important to them so that agencies garnish the resources to do so. Thank you. And then this is a last question uh, uh, and, a, and a comment I'll echo is a thank you to all the panelists for the work you are doing. And uh, just kind of a check in, big picture overview, and maybe a parting thought from you, Randy, is it, it, when, you, when you put all this information together, what's the overall mood on the health of Lake Huron fisheries? Yeah, you know, I think Daryl and, and Todd and Chris and others as they walk through the the prey fish and the and the fishery catch rates and I, I you know I caught what Todd said that you know if you effort in, is declining but if you get out there there's a lot of opportunity Saginaw Bay with walleye um, the Lake Shinoes, the St. Mary's River but the open water fishery uh, to see the coho return the Atlantic salmon we're expecting to increase last year was a little bit of a dip uh, but we're expecting increases there, as well as solid lake trout fishery and Chinook fishery um, and steelhead returns this spring are um, kind of through the roof. Really good returns, really good uh, uh, rain events to pull those fish in. So I look at it as Lake Huron has amazing opportunity. Uh, we're working closely with the advisors to make sure that our management activities are in balance with the lake. And that in itself is going to produce great fishing opportunities and sustainable fisheries. So um, you know, I'm looking for some warm weather myself and hoping to get out there. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you, Randy. You know, it's always uh, real nice to have uh, this management uh, update and perspective and kind of tying it all together here at the end. So thank you uh, to yourself and all of the, the organizations and agencies and panelists and presenters. We appreciate, uh, you know, a really great 
uh, evening of uh, great information. So I, I'll uh, close this out formally and if folks want to hang online, you're welcome to do so. We can continue to ask and answer questions. But again, I'm just going to say thank you uh, to all of our presenters and all of the partners that have put a lot of time and energy into to pulling this workshop together. Again, uh, we were stuffing envelopes for a in-person out in, out in your community workshop. And then this was a, a total redirect and everybody really stepped up and, and made this happen. So thank you. Uh, and thank you to the, to the attendees. Uh, most of you hung, uh, almost all of you hung right to the end. And, and really appreciate that. Uh, these workshops don't happen if, if people don't show up. Uh, this has been recorded. Uh, we will post uh, this on the Michigan Sea Grant uh, site in the near future. Um, there are uh, a few next sessions that I mentioned. There's the co coffee uh, conversation and coffee meeting with the Department of Natural Resources next Thursday. Uh, there is a Saginaw Bay focused session. If you're in, into uh, perch and walleye, uh, we'll be talking Saginaw Bay on May 14th. And then on May 21st, we'll be in the Lation Ohio Island uh, area. So uh, you, ha you do have to register for each of those workshops individually. Uh, lastly, there are uh, uh, lots of information that's been thrown around. I will send a follow-up email to anybody that's registered uh, that has uh, some of these links uh, and information and handouts that were uh, uh, shared and discussed tonight. Um, I'll also send you an evaluation. We'd like to know how we did. Uh, those evaluations will help us uh, to improve and hopefully uh, do this even better next time. So with that, I will say thank you and uh, normally would say safe travels, but uh, be safe at home. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of our formal. I see uh, attendees are, are dropping off, which I wanted to give them that exit if they were interested. Um, there are some questions uh, still online. I think, um, actually, maybe only one. So uh, any DNR, this is for Randy, any DNR future plans to pursue uh, boat wash requirements for inland lakes to prevent invasive species uh, spread to inland lakes? Yep, and I was actually going to type a response there, Brandon, to William, and I was going to suggest that he contact uh, Seth Herbst in our uh, um, AIS ASRA unit. Um, but yes, it, depending on the inland lakes, there are, um, I know Higgins Lake has a bo boat wash, um, uh, and most people are probably aware that the regulations did change. So now you're actually required by law to drain your vessel, to inspect it for aquatic vegetation or any kind of aquatic hitchhikers. So, um, but I know there are there are 10,000 in the lakes and, and 10,000 plus in Michigan, and we're not gonna have a boat washing station at each one of those. So it depends what lake they're looking for. And I would suggest again, um, contacting our uh, Lansing office, um, Seth Herbst and uh, Michigan DNR, and he'll have more information on that. Great. Uh, thanks. Um, and then on, on the invasive uh, question, there was an early on question that related to zebra mussel populations in the lakes. And I know uh, generally how we've been communicating is zebra mussels really are not a player in the open water Great Lakes anymore. And really what you're dealing with is their, their bigger, badder uh, uh, cousin the quagga, quagga mussel and the quagga mussels have this competitive advantage of uh, being able to utilize more habitat in um, the lakes so they don't require a hard substrate, substrate for example so they can they can bury themselves in the sand they have a little longer uh, siphon so they can they can reach out a little farther for that algae and and they can also a little more tolerant of, of colder water and, and some other conditions so uh, really uh, zebra mussel or quagga mussels picked up where, where zebra mussels took off and I see Daryl also responded to that as well um, last question uh, from Jim here. Uh, question: Brook Trout at Port Sandlac two weeks ago. Question mark. Yeah, and, and I guess let me um, let me jump to Joel Anderson at Probate. His question. Um, I oh, know yeah. that there's a couple Troy and others that that jumped in, and um, they were they were looking they were looking about concerns of uh, gaps in data, especially Southern Lake Huron, um, and how that'll factor into our decisions in certain areas. And um, you know, I think. This is a start of a conversation we're going to have um, in a nor with COVID-19 in many facets and many different venues because we will not have the traditional information. We're going to have huge gaps. Even so, in a normal year, I know our Creel survey, um, we're bare bones in terms of covering all of the port, not all the ports, but the major ports and trying to rotate. And, um, you know, we've been looking to argue for 
resources so we can cover more uh, of the information, not have the gaps that, that Joel and others are referring to. And now we're going to go into a year like 2020 with, with um, you know, months and areas of the lake entirely with, with, that are blacked out, absolutely no data. So, um, you know, I, I think the answer to his question is really, it makes workshops like this, conversations with our advisory committee, even more important because um, there are, they're going to be out there fishing and, and, and making observations where we won't have the raw data um, to be able to look to the trends. And so um, it also means we're probably going to have to be a little bit more cautious in terms of our decision making and where we go. So I thought those are good questions. Sorry to jump in right now. I just want to address those. Great. And Thanks. as far as the, the brook trout at Port Sanilac two weeks ago, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not okay. sure. Send the picture to um, if it's Port Sanilac. Send it to Jason Gosto. I'm sure he would love to try to look at that picture or fish and like to hear about it. Great. All right. Well, I think that brings us to the end of a, a fun evening. So I, again, I appreciate uh, folks that uh, hung on to the end here. And again, appreciate our panelists and presenters. Um, at this point, we will uh, end the meeting.